do their little whizzy bang check thing. Hi, I'm Steve. Welcome to How To In Five and Reviews. If you're a new viewer, welcome. If you're a return viewer, welcome back. And this is my detailed review of the BMW K1600 GT. What's it like as a used bike buy? I have it on the track. I have it uh, in the city, through the hills. I even do a little bit of dirt work with this bike. And I can tell you, this is one hell of a bike. But stick with us until the end of the video. I'll give you a whole lot of details on the bike and my verdict, and spoiler alert, it's all good. So as regular viewers to my channel, you would know that I'm a huge fan of the big six cylinder Honda Goldwing. I was riding one actually only the week before doing the review on this bike, and I was listening to an interview with a retired British motorcycle racer, someone who I have an enormous amount of respect for, and he was asked the question, what are your six best bikes of all time? And I was expecting to hear all head down, bum up sports bikes, but number four on his list was the BMW K1600 GT. Now, to me, this was like uh, waving a, a red rag at a ball. It was something that I could get access to. So after a little bit of research, I got on an aeroplane at some ungodly hour in the morning and flew across to Melbourne uh, in Australia because I couldn't find one in my state, got hold of it and then spent eight hours on the bike, riding it home back to South Australia to get a good feel for this bike. And then I do a whole lot of other things with the bike. So if you are in the market for a big, luxury touring bike that you can just gobble up the miles on. Um, stay tuned, hopefully you enjoy it, and this will give you a bit of an insight into the big BMW. So this particular bike is a 214 model. You can expect to pay about half the cost of a new model. We're in 2022 now, uh, 2014 in Australia, these are up around the early $40,000 mark. Um, so you can expect to pay around that 20, early 20s, anywhere in that region. This is a fully optioned GT. It's in what they call Sekiro orange. I call it more of a, I guess a burnt orange. It's got the full sat nav system in it. Uh, which I think is a Garmin sat-nav. It has the user adjustable suspension, um, the user adjustable riding modes, and by that I mean rain, road, and sport, or I think they call it dynamic on this one. The sound of the Big Six is just something to behold. It just has the nicest note you can possibly imagine. The jewel of the crown, of course, is this beautiful inline six cylinder motor. Um, it's no secret that BMW are the masters of inline sixes. This is set transverse, so it's across the bike. It's 1649 cc, so that's a little over, what is that? A little over 100 cubic inches. It's it's a big motor. Um, it's got a 12.2 to one compression ratio, so you really do need to run it on the premium fuel. Um, I guess that's no secret when you start getting up into those compression ratios. It's liquid cooled. It develops a whopping 160 and a half horsepower. Uh, that's 118 kilowatts if you're more of a kilowatts person. Double overhead cams with four valves per cylinder, so it breathes nice and easily. But unlike your, um, your nitrous powered screamer sports bikes that develop their horsepower up at 12 and 12 and a half thousand revs, this is getting 160 horsepower at 7,750 revs and it is linear. Front brake 
brakes, you've got dual 320 mil. That's uh, getting up towards 13 inches, I guess. Disc rotors, they're four piston BMW calipers. And initially I thought with the weight of this bike, and I'll cover that in a minute. Initially I thought, oh, maybe that ain't look quite big enough, but uh, I couldn't have been more wrong. After a couple of hours of having this bike on the track, there was no brake fade at all. In fact, I faded way before the brakes did. So they are really, really up to the task. Rear brakes, another 320 millimeter disc. Um, they're only a two piston caliper on the back, but the, the whole brake system is that BMW, the, um, what do they call it, the Motrad. It's, of course, it's got ABS. I don't think anything comes out nowadays without ABS, but um, it's partially integral as well. So uh, when you touch that front, you get some through to the rear. I don't know if it's the other way around. If you touch the rear, you get um, some through to the front. But um, yeah, I, I mean, the brakes, for the bulk of this bike, they, they really are superb. The headlights on this thing are amazing. You can see you've got these daytime running lights around here, it gives it a real intimidating look, but it's got this adaptive Xenon headlight in the front. So if I start it up, so you can see there the headlight, it rolls up into place. And that's on low beam, uh, spotlights, they're on down the bottom there. And it's an adaptive headlight, so it's got roll angle compensation. So when you're cornering and you're going around bends, etc., the, the light beam stays parallel and it follows around the bend. Um, they're really good lights and of course high beam is there, so a nice bright high beam. There's still a... Um, like a halogen type high beam but terrific lights bmw have put a, a heap of work into the headlights on this i i think that is also an option on the gt rear lights i'll just start the ignition you can see the tail light is on there um, left hand indicator all led right hand indicator led and then of course the brake light comes on which is led again over the top of the tail light all nice and bright you'd have to be uh, a pretty poor driver to run into the back of this. The dimensions of the bike, as you, well, you see it sitting here, it's um, just under two and a half metres long or 98 inches long. It's a uh, thousand millimetres wide. So that's 39.4 inches. And that is from the very outside of the mirrors. They are the widest part of the bike. Uh, wheelbase between the axles, 1680 or 86 inches. Seat height on this one is 32 inches. Um, you can get an optional seat that drops it down to about 29 and a half inches. The dry weight, well actually dry weight's really useless, isn't it? You're never gonna be running your bike dry. Uh, wet weight is 319 kilos. So time you put a bit of gear in, etc. you're going to be up around that 325 or 720 odd pounds um, in full on weight, I guess. But uh, that's not bad for a big, heavy touring bike. In tight areas such as this, um, it's really no problem at all. This has a lot of weight, this bike, but as soon as it's moving, it is very, very maneuverable. You can slow it right down here, as you can see, and uh, there's a few loose leaves and sticks and things in this car park, and it, it's not a worry. Um, it's a strange bike in the sense that as soon as you are moving, the weight disappears. It feels very much like uh, even the NC750. Um, it will maneuver and turn. You just have to maintain your momentum. If you get the bike too slow, of course the weight will increase and make it uh, uh, not too manageable. But um, look, as far as maneuvering around at slow speed, it's great. Indicators on the front, they're LED and nice and bright. You can see I've got the hazard lights on there. And they're also nice and visual from the side. The rear suspension, not that you can really see much down in there, but it's a single um, paralever, they call it. Central strut, a spring strut in there with um, you know compression, rebound, all of that sort of stuff variable. And you can do all of that from up on the, uh, the bars with the controls that we'll have a look at in a sec. 
Front suspension is, um, I mean, it's typical BMW. It is superb. Whether you're on the bitumen, whether you're on the dirt, rough terrain, you don't get the dive uh, when you hit the brakes. Uh, what do they call it on this one? The dual longitudinal control arms. Um, in there with the big center strut, it is, it truly is a wonderful suspension system. I think if you had a look at my report on the RT, and you had a look at the direction change that you can do with this front suspension while under braking uh, in an emergency situation, uh, I don't really think it has any peers, the suspension. For road going suspension, it works really, really well on unsealed or unpaved roads such as this one. I'm not trying to compare it with the Super Tenere or a, a GSA or something of that nature, but I often get asked, Steve, why do you test all of these big bikes on the dirt as well as the, the bitumen, of course, but you do a lot of dirt road riding. And reason for that, Australia has the ninth biggest road network in the world. It has 823,000 kilometers, that's 511 thousand miles of roads but interestingly 466,000 kilometers that's 289,000 miles of those roads are unsealed I have a property in the country and I'm frequently there on unsealed roads to me it is important that they work well on the dirt roads I've ridden some sports bikes that are to be honest absolutely useless on this type of road um, the BMW really does operate well on this type of road. If you're a machinery buff and you've been wondering what I'm parked next to all day, this is a 1955 David Shearer header. Um, it's for grain crops, wheat, barley, oats, etc. It's a BMW, so uh, of course, shaft drive, of course, and the, the rear suspension, um, it's called a paralever single-sided swing arm. Uh, so you've got nothing on the other side as you can see there, um, so uh, it makes it nice and simple, I guess, to get the back wheel on and off. It always visually, to me, single-sided swing arms, I think, oh, but uh, I know everyone goes that way now. Riding through this section here, um, I mean, this bike is an absolute pleasure of a bike to ride. And to be honest here, I'm moving up and down through the gears. You really don't need to be. You can leave this in top gear. In fact, I think I've got a bit of footage of that coming up shortly, but uh, Bitumen conditions are pretty average, the road itself, um, but it is just a pleasure to sit on the bike to listen to that sweet, sweet note of the six cylinder. Um, it just sounds so nice. You could listen to it all day. One of my fondest memories is a friend and I, uh, we were driving along once, or riding rather, along once, and we're on a couple of CBX Honda six cylinders. He's a, a CBX enthusiast and they were identical motorbikes riding parallel and the harmonics that set up between the two of us going uphill at full throttle it was just glorious and um, uh, I don't know that it's that easy to beat the sound of the big six they are just so lovely Gearbox, six speed manual. Um, it's a, I've never missed a gear while I've been riding this bike. And as I said, I've had it, um, we haven't had a look at that yet, have we? But I've had it on the track, I've had it in the dirt. It, it is a, you know it's in gear for sure. It gives a decent big clunk and it is sweet. It moves between the gears, but it's not a real refined little box like you'd find on a, uh, maybe a 604 or something like that. You definitely know you are changing gears and you can probably hear that in some of the clips, but um, yeah, a good strong box. Has these little glove boxes here, so uh, there it is there, push the button, that pops open. Look, not very big really, but I've just got a set of gloves in there, a mask, um, that's time of, oh, sign of the times, isn't it? Wearing a mask and a little first aid kit. Um, one would hope you never have to get into there, but it's nice, rubber sealed all the way around. So that's good, no moisture gets in there. It is a bit of an awkward spot to get to, so you're, you're probably not going to want to be accessing that, um, you know, all the time. But uh, yeah, it's nice to have. Also, locking, you can key lock it here, but I'll show you, oh, actually I'll show you the one on the other side, and I'll show you the big plus of these. On the right hand side, another little 
box down here. This one's, uh, I think it's designed for the telephone. You can see it has that, that foam type setup where you put your phone in, USB outlet, and uh, what would that be? What do they used to call it? MP3. Um, if you want to tap your music, although that's all really done, Spotify, whatever it's called nowadays. Uh, Look, a great little compartment and all waterproof, but uh, to be honest, the phone doesn't really. I got an iPhone 13, and oh, just it only just you wouldn't want to have any bigger phone than that, um, or it's not going to fit in there. But one of the big pluses is that with the keys, um, I mean, there's five boxes you've got this one at this knee, one at your left knee, the two side boxes, and the top box. With the push of a button, everything is now locked. And that's the two sides and the top box and the little glove box on the other side. Unlock. So there's no running around with keys trying to individually lock all the little doors. That's a really good thing. I think one of the unique features of this bike also is just how fast it is to convert it from a full-on tourer where you're on a nice big cross-country haul with the cruise control set to a sports bike. And I might just add here, I'm on a public road, as you can see by vehicles going past. I don't want to do anything silly, but it's just great to have a run through the hills. So I might say I have actually enhanced the exhaust note for this video just so as you can hear the beautiful big six cylinder motor pairing away. It's not actually this loud when you're on the bike. To a city commuter. And it's surprisingly simple to ride for a big tour. It's surprisingly simple to ride in the city. I take off the side boxes. You've got access to your top box for when you're just riding around um, in and around traffic. It is a breeze. In fact, it's, it's really, really simple. If you remember that the extremities, the widest part of the bike are those two mirrors. So, so long as the mirrors comfortably fit in between other vehicles, etc., you can filter down through the traffic with ease to a bagger where you're out on a Sunday morning going for a cup of coffee at a local cafe. And just to show you how quick that is, key in, turn, handle up, that's that one off. Sit it up there, hopefully the, the wind doesn't blow it off. This one here, round, turn, that's up. That's the second box off. To remove the rear box, basically push the button, lift the lever, up goes the box, there's a little carpet mat in here, and you see this little release and lock scenario. Push it, turn, like so, close the box, and then just lift it off. But of course there's that wire. And voila, from a luxury tourer to a sports bike in less than a minute. Wire to put it back on, line up the two little sections there, open, Lift the carpet once again, rotate that knob back and you'll hear the click. And that is now fastened onto the back, but you do need to plug that wire back in again. And the reason for that wire, uh, I don't know if you can see up in there, no you can't really, but there's a nice LED light up in here. It has gas struts, it has central locking. So if you want that central locking to work off of your key, you need to plug, and the wire, and the light, you need to plug that wire back in. Um, I think there could be a bit of better design there, and maybe the, the plug itself could be here in this section of wire. Um, I mean, really, it just runs through. You've got to feed it back under the seat. Uh, a little waterproof plug there that you just turn open and shut um, would be a good little modification if you've got one of these models. That's the little keyhole there, so plonk it in, turn, and that releases the seat. Actually, while I'm back here, uh, that's also for the rear seat. Heated seats, high, low, or the other way around, whichever way it is. Um, but nice heated rear seat, backrest there for a passenger, so that's a, a nice place to be. Of course, I'm going up and down through the gears, as you can hear when I'm, I'm riding around, but 
if you don't want to be in gear change mode, the power overlap of the big six, you can get the speed down very, very low. If you look at this scenario here, I'm going around this left-hand bend. The speed gets down to about 40 kilometers an hour. I'm still in top gear, sixth gear. That's about 25 mile an hour. You don't have to be rowing this thing up and down through the gears like a lot of smaller capacity bikes. If you just want to have a nice, gentle ride through the hills, it is lovely for a relaxing ride if you don't feel like changing. When you're riding the GT, um, you're in like a cocoon. It's a beautiful place to be, but it can get a bit warm when I was on the interstate coming back. It was up around that 38 degrees Celsius or a 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I was looking for a little more ventilation. I had the screen down. You've got these little wings. I'm not sure what you want to call them. Air vents either side of the bike. And basically you just grab them, pull them out, one each side, you can do that while riding and push them back in, it's nice and simple. But when they're out, they direct a jet of air straight through it, magnifies the pressure, and it pushes it straight into that lower part of your chest to get that extra bit of ventilation. If camping is your thing, you can head off down your favorite dirt trail, um, wherever that may be, you can carry all of your gear, set up camp in your favorite camping spot. It's just lovely for that. Maybe motels are more your thing. Okay, maybe not this motel, but something a little more upmarket. And one of the big pluses of this bike is you can park it in any company and it just seems to fit into the group. Looking at a secondhand GT1600, make sure it comes with the books. A bike of this prestige and value should have all of the service records here. It should have every book that came with the bike. It should have two keys, of course, and it should have your little black key. You don't want to lose that. That is your coded key. So if ever you were to lose your master keys, uh, well, sorry, that is, I guess, in a sense, a master key. If ever you were to lose your keys for the bike, you will need that to get a duplicate key in the back here. There's a little computer chip that is unique to this bike only. And something you would know if you've watched any of my other videos is that I love taking the bikes off-road. Now, this is not the ideal off-roader by any means, but it's a heap of fun. Uh, 160 horsepower, traction control off. It is an absolute monster with this amount of weight, but caveat, if you're not used to big, heavy, powerful bikes, I would not suggest riding the, uh, the 160 horsepower GT off-road. The little 17 inch front wheel is not overly fond of rocks and stone and of course sand. You need to keep a lot of weight back. You need that rear wheel spinning with the traction control off. Otherwise it will bury its nose. But uh, I mean, generally I do this a lot on pretty well all of my bikes and uh, it's a real heart starter. Uh, I guess, what would you call it? A bit of an adrenaline rush or whatever it may be. But it's something that I really enjoy doing. Fuel capacity wise, about 26 and a half litres at seven US gallons. Um, still has this pain of a cap that comes back. I always find it hard to get the nozzle in. Why they don't hinge it forward, uh, I'm not really sure. But that will give you about 500 kilometres of range or a little over 300 miles. So you don't have to be stopping at uh, every fuel station to fill it up. And if you're into radios on a bike, 
um, above your left knee, all of the stereo system controls, that's patched through to the Bluetooth also. The cockpit on the Big Beamer is a really nice place to be. If I turn the key on there, you can see the big number six, that replicates the six, indicating six cylinders that's on the side of the motor. The gauges do their little whizzy bang check thing. It's probably some fancy name for that, but I don't know, whizzy bang all do. Um, we've got a digital speedo down in the center. You have your odometer at the bottom. You have your trip meter over on the right, clock 302 p.m. over on the left. You have the fuel gauge here, that's the white bar that you can see. Uh, to the left of that, not inside at the moment because the motor's not running, is the temperature gauge that runs up here. Neutral light, another neutral light up there. Actually, I don't know why that new neutral light's up there, if it's down there. But anyway, uh, sat nav up in the top, up here, um, full sat nav system, which is fantastic. That works well. And uh, to operate this, uh, Initially, it looks a little bit confusing. And I think when you first hop on one of these, you think, oh God, look at all these things and buttons to push. But it's really quite simple to use. You can see the digital speedo. There's the analog speedo here and the tachometer on that side. Uh, the digital speedo over here on the left bar is the menu button. If I scroll through that menu button, we have all sorts of things here. Stopwatch, tire, tire pressures. So you can see here it comes up in bar. Um, I would like to think I could convert that to PSI. It's probably in the menu somewhere, but that will give you your tire pressures and push it again over. We go up to our comfort level. So that's one rider you can see is indicated there. You can see the next one, rider and luggage. Two riders, that's actually two riders and luggage. Keep scrolling up, what do we got? Normal. Now, when I was riding it hard the other day on the track, I had it in sport down there. You've got normal, sport, comfort, Comfort is just magic carpet ride. Push the menu button again, and we have page. Now, you can see on the left-hand side here, this is the whiz wheel. So what I'm doing, I'm pushing the menu button to change the screens. The whiz wheel that turns on the left-hand side, and you can operate all this with your gloves on. I guess, sorry about the wind, by the way. It's blowing a gale here at the moment. But the whiz wheel, if you think of that as like a mouse on your computer that you're using at home or your laptop, that is like moving the mouse because that will get you through to the different areas and then to select something. So we'll go up to page and then you push the whiz wheel to the right and that's like hitting the left clicker on a mouse. So if I push that, up comes the sat nav, acquiring satellites. Okay, I push it one more time, it'll go across to the compass, which is not reading, or the heading is not reading. Push it one more time, it'll go through, and you've got a complete trip A, trip B, max speed, moving average, overall average, stop time, moving time, total time. You can reset all that. Push it one more time, and it'll come back to this screen here. Um, so pushing to the Right on the whiz wheel, it's just like the left click on a mouse. Let's roll through one more thing. What have we got here? Heated handle grips. Uh, BMW, I don't think anything matches BMW for their heated grips. They're just fantastic. So I've selected heated grips with the menu button. I then roll that whiz wheel to take the heated grips up to where you would like them. And on maximum, even with the stars at the Alpines on the big gloves, um, they are so hot. They are just fantastic. And being a soft Aussie, anything under about 15 degrees C, I have got the heated grips on because I'm used to warm weather. Um, so we turn that down, it goes off. Push the menu button one more time. Now we've got the seat heating. I'm not sure if you can read that or not, but seat heating, that is for the pilot or for the rider rather. So once again, roll that whiz wheel, up she goes. And you can put it up to maximum seat heating. And there's nothing quite like a nice hot tush on a leather seat. Um, yeah, that's really nice actually. I like the seat heating. Uh, anyway, roll it down, that's now off. Push it one more time. We go to audio, we roll the whiz wheel, so like moving the mouse down. We can come time, date, there's all sorts of options. DTC, now that's your traction control. So we'll push, right click, or oh, actually left click. Um, now, the traction control is on, which means if you're on a loose surface or whatever, and you open the tap, as in give it heaps of throttle, it will 
not spin the back wheel as soon as it senses it's starting to get wheel spin it will slow it and it's not a vicious jar like on some bikes it just softens the throttle um, on the track the other day I mean you've got to be a, a loony to um, turn the traction control off so of course I turned it off but um, so we roll it down to traction off push like a left click one more time you can see that's lit up now it says off once what they mean by that is I'm riding around having fun with the traction control off sliding and doing whatever it is I might be doing if you turn the bike off walk away come back turn the bike back on again it will automatically put the traction control back on um, so safety feature in there you will have to manually turn it off each time if you saw my Tenere video um, that has a more vicious traction control system I turn it off all the time on the Super Tenere. Uh, we'll roll through that one more time and we can roll up, turn the whiz wheel up, user audio. There are so many different things in here you can play with and back to the digital speedo. So fairly simple, once you get the operation of this menu button and the whiz wheel and the click, it's fairly simple to use. Um, on the right hand bar here, you've got your start button, which is there and you're off, that's all on the one switch, which is good instead of two. On the top here you have mode, and the mode button, if I push the mode button, you can see over here at the moment it's in dynamic. Push it one more time, rain. Push it another time, and you're in road. That will, you do have to be stopped for that selection to happen, but um, that's, yeah, look, pretty good idea. Um, you've got lots of power underneath here, and if you're not, uh, riding like a rabbit uh, it's a good idea to have rain just softens the throttle it's a real soft power delivery although this motor is this motor is so linear in its power delivery it softens it out dramatically um, up on top the next button you have here is the central locking you see the little suitcase come up there with a key in it so if you're not using the remote to open and shut your five boxes as I said before there's five of them to lock with a key it would be an absolute pain if you don't want to use the remote or you haven't got the remote on you whatever that may be before you turn the motor off you can push that and it will lock all the cases and unlock them for you although you have to turn it back on of course for it to unlock on the left hand side cruise control standard on and off with the cruise control same as a motor car really um, push it forward to set to cancel the cruise control as in you're coming up to somewhere our intersection coming up we're going to relieve the cruise control front brake will automatically cancel it clutch will automatically cancel it right brake or the foot brake will automatically cancel it but one other feature that I haven't seen before is rather than having to hit the brake or something if you just roll the throttle forward about a um, quarter of an inch, six mil, it will also cancel it. So there's no need to go hitting something. And another really interesting feature on this one is you're getting along, let's say you're sitting on 140 kilometers an hour, you're in top gear, cruise control is on. If you go to shift down without canceling the crew, the cruise is set. If you just pull the clutch in, boom, to, to, that was a rev of the motor, to shift down a gear, it it's seamless. It doesn't rev the motor. It doesn't do anything it's not meant to do. That's a good idea. Um, this little switch here is a little spotlights. They're the little driving lights that we saw down low. They're underneath. That one there, hazard lights. There's your indicators, by the way, on the panel. Turn the hazard lights off. Um, what else have we got here? Oh, indicators. Or indicators are down here, right, left push the button to cancel which is lovely they're on the left hand side in fact all of this operation on the left hand side even with my heavy alpine star gloves on which i use for winter riding it's all simple to operate and it can be done with the heavy gloves and the cruise fortunately is on the left it's a pain when a cruise control is on the right hand side because you're trying to hold the throttle and set your cruise Cruises on the left, easy to get to. The menu on the left, indicators, unlike if you saw my video on the I have bought a police bike or whatever it was called. Um, it has the paddle either side. It's an old 
07 RT, which I will admit I have got used to now, but um, I do like the indicators on the left hand side here. Uh, what else? Horn down underneath there. Uh, it's a terrible horn. It should be on a motor scooter. A big bike like this should have a proper horn. Um, on the back here, which is just out of camera shot, is the high beam. So we flick it there. High beam comes up in the center of the panel. Back, if you pull that switch back, which you can also do easily with big gloves on, that will then flash. So if you're indicating that you're going to overtake or whatever, it initially looks a bit confusing, this panel, but it's not. A little bit of playing with it. I had that interstate coming home and played around with a lot of these things while I had hours and hours of straight line riding. And you don't need to look down with your entire head. They've got it set up just at the right angle where you can just flick the eye down, see the panel, look up again. The light, as in sunlight, no matter what the conditions around you, um, it all stays nice and clear. If you're wondering what these two lights are here, one flashing, etc., that is the ABS, the warning system, and the traction control just telling me that they are not operational. As soon as you put it in gear and you start to move off, those two lights go out. <laughs> well, you hope they do. No, they do. They go out when you start to move off. Um, that's the panel, I guess, in one. What I'll do now, this one here is the electric windscreen. I'll just move the position of the camera to show you how the electric screen works. So camera up a little bit now, and the electric windscreen is a nice, it's just a rocker switch. So roll the switch up, up goes the screen. She goes up nice and tall. Uh, this is the GT screen, so it is cut out through here. Um, it is cut out, but one of the interesting things, let's say, let's go midway. So let's say that's your position of riding with the screen. Um, when you turn the bike off, so I'll turn this, the ignition off now, the screen will automatically return to its lowest position. When you start the bike, put it back in gear and you ride off again, as soon as it's in gear and you start moving, the screen has a memory, it will go back to the same position that you had it previously set, but return home when you turn it off. And that's a good thing if you're putting covers on the bike, etc. Um, does that about cover? Oh, one more thing I did want to mention, and that is the mirrors. Uh, in the mirrors, with the mirrors, they are folding. So if you do clout them on a wall or you hit something, they will actually fold in. They're not going to break the side out of the bike or something like that. Um, that's a, a, good, a good idea. There we go, back in position. That is the cockpit on the K1600 GT. And as I said earlier, it is a really nice place to be. So with that magic carpet ride, the beautiful classy lines of this bike, whether it be for long distance hauls, solo or two up, whether it be used as a city commuter for your daily ride or just going for a blast on the weekend, maybe through the hills or to your favorite coffee spot to sit down and have a cup of coffee with mates on a weekend. Does it earn the right to be in his top six bikes of all time you know what i think he may just be right